Australia's military history is more than just a collection of dates and the locations of war-ravaged battlefields. It is the stories of service and sacrifice of those who have answered the call of their country of birth or adoption and the enduring legacy they have created. Join me as we look into one of those stories. I'm your host, Ross Manuel, and welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, Australia's Military History, a Doc Network podcast. Now let's get started. G'day friends and welcome to episode 57 of the podcast and the first episode of 2024. This year is already shaping up to be an awesome one for the podcast. I have a lot of things planned for it and I can't wait to share them with you. There's just one announcement for the first episode of the year and that is to make sure to check out the podcast Ko-Fi store and pick up the awesome Armored Emu Brigade morale patch. They are selling like hotcakes, so make sure you get yours. Also, I just want to do a quick shout out to Liam. Thanks for subscribing. And to you and all other veterans who are listening to the podcast, you're all badasses who inspire me to do this. Now, with that out of the way, let's get started with the Australian who invented the periscope rifle. William Charles Bullock Beach was born in the town of Wellington, Shropshire, England, on the 1st of May, 1878, to George and Kate Beach. Not much is really known about his early life and schooling, or even his life before he arrived in Australia. Save that at the age of 22, Bill, as he was known, volunteered for two years overseas service in the Second Anglo-Boer War in or about December 1900. This is evidenced by the fact that he received both the King and Queen South African medals. However, there are two conflicting primary accounts of his service in the conflict. One has him serving with the British Army's Volunteer Field Artillery Force. The other has him serving in the Glenmorganshire Yeomanry for the duration of the conflict. The Glenmorganshire Yeomanry was a Welsh Auxiliary Cavalry Unit of the British Army. Both the Glenmorganshire Yeomanry and the Volunteer Field Artillery were a part of Rundle's Starving 8th Division under the command of General Leslie Rundle. And technically both of these are possible as Wellington Shropshire sits on the border of England and Wales. Unfortunately, British service records pertaining to the Boer War were either destroyed by administrative decree or by the German Blitz of the Second World War. This means it is actually impossible for us to determine which of these two accounts is correct, but unfortunately because both are primary sources, I couldn't discount one or the other. What is common from both these records is that Beach, like most soldiers who participated in the Anglo-Boer War, suffered great privations. One account has him stranded with two other soldiers and having to subsist for a number of days on pools of stagnated water to survive. What also happened in South Africa was that he regularly encountered soldiers of the Australian colonies, which impressed him greatly, especially their carefree attitudes. Following the Boer War, depending on which account you refer to, Beach's life goes in two completely different directions until he arrives in Australia in 1910. The record that has him serving with the Volunteer Field Artillery has him serving for an additional five years with the Shropshire Yeomanry before, inspired by his contact with the colonial forces, emigrating to Australia in 1910. For the record of him serving with the Glenmorganshire Yeomanry, he travels to New Zealand in 1904 before jumping the ditch to Australia in 1910. Either way, by 1910, Beach has settled in the central western New South Wales town of Condobolin and is working as a builder. At the onset of the First World War, Beach had risen to the position of builder's foreman when, at the age of 36, he was amongst the first men from Condobolin to volunteer for overseas service. By all accounts, Beach was a prominent voice in the community to encourage enlistment, and he joined a group known as the Condobolin Diehards, which were men like himself who felt the need to answer the call for duty from the mother country. He departed with the rest of the Diehards in August 1914 to enlist in Kensington, Sydney on the 24th of September. The Condobolin Diehards, Beach included, were all assigned to the C Company, 2nd Australian Infantry Battalion, as part of the 1st Australian Brigade. After a period of training in Australia, Beach and the other diehards departed Sydney aboard the troop ship HMAT A23 Suffolk on the 18th of October 1914 as part of the first convoy bound for Europe, joining 21,000 other Australians, 8,500 New Zealanders and 12,000 horses under the escort of the Australian cruisers HMAS Sydney and Melbourne, the flagship of the Royal Navy's China Squadron, the armoured cruiser HMS Minotaur and the Japanese battle cruiser the HIJMS Abuki. En route, Sydney left the convoy to engage and sink the German light cruiser SMS Emden at the Battle of Cocos Island on the 9th of November. It should be noted that while Ibuki had the status of being classed as a battle cruiser and her commanding officer being the most experienced officer in the group, Captain Kanji Kato had wanted the honour of engaging the Emden himself, but had been ordered to stay with the convoy and serve as its only protection while Sydney went after Emden. 
This decision was celebrated by the Royal Australian Navy as the samurai spirit of the Ibuki being passed on to Sydney and was celebrated whenever any Imperial Japanese vessel visited Sydney. So much so that when the Ibuki fell victim to the Washington Naval Treaty, materials were salvaged from the ship and a 196 scale model of the warship was built and given to Australia as a gift in 1925. The model actually sits in the first gallery of the First World War of the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, opposite relics collected relating to the Battle of Cocos Islands, which includes the ship's bells of HMAS Sydney and SMS Emden. After a brief layover in Colombo to take on supplies, the convoy arrived in Alexandria on the 8th of December. From there, Beach and the rest of the 2nd Battalion entered camps to continue training with the rest of the 1st Division in the Egyptian desert. While the initial intent of the combined Australian Imperial Force and New Zealand Expeditionary Force was to join British forces in the Western Front, the Ottoman Empire's entry into the war on the side of the Central Powers immediately threatened the vital trade route of the Suez Canal. This necessitated the newly raised Anzac Force to be stationed there to defend it, as Ottoman forces would actually attack in February 1915, although the 2nd Battalion was not involved. In response to requests by Tsar Nicholas II to open up the Black Sea shipping lanes and also knock the Turks out of the war, British High Command decided to land a force on the Gallipoli Peninsula near the Dardanelles using a force comprised primarily of British, French and Indian troops, along with the Australian and New Zealand forces, after the naval operation failed so miserably. And thus, the 2nd Battalion, along with the rest of the Anzac Force, boarded transports at Alexandria, bound for Lemnos, and then at the pre-dawn on the 25th of April 1915, Soldiers climbed from transports into lifeboats before being towed to shallow water by lighters and then rowed ashore by naval ratings onto a beach that would become known as Anzac Cove. Second Battalion would come ashore in the second and third waves, with half of the battalion being sent to the top of the hill to support the 3rd Australian Infantry Brigade that was pushing towards the landmark named Baby 700 that overlooked the beachhead. Beach and the rest of C Company was held in reserve on the beach. By the afternoon, the commanding officer of the 2nd Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel George Brown, who in civilian life was actually a member of parliament in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly, led the reserve force up the slopes to reinforce a bridging position between the Australian-held areas known as Walker's Ridge and Russell's Top. Walker's Ridge is named after Brigadier General Harold Walker, which was the commanding officer of the New Zealand Infantry Brigade during the landing, while Russell's Top is named after Brigadier Andrew Russell, the commander of the New Zealand Mounted Rifle Brigade. Beach and the rest of B and C companies held the position for two days, until they were relieved by the Wellington Battalion. They then mounted a bayonet charge to clear the crest of Russell's top until an Ottoman countercharge forced them back to the junction. There they remained until the 28th of April when they were sent back to the beach. As the night fell on the 25th of April, the initiative had been lost by the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force and they had started to dig into what meagre parcels of Turkish soil they had managed to seize. And the task of consolidation began. While on Gallipoli, Beach was promoted to Lance Corporal in early May. By mid-May, Ottoman forces had gathered in sufficient numbers to launch a devastating counterattack with the intent of driving the Allied forces into the sea, but by the 24th of May, this attempt had been decisively defeated and as I mentioned last year with Edward Atfield, from that point neither side was able to dislodge the other off the peninsula and static trench warfare commenced. For Beach and the 2nd Battalion, that meant occupying positions overlooking the ravine known as Owens Gully between Johnson's Gully and Lone Pine. Don't worry folks, for reference I'll include maps on this website for our social media pages. On the 19th of May, at the height of the fiercest fighting, Beach had been in a sap trench or a covered forward observation post ahead of the Australian positions, had returned to the front line and approached a nearby officer, Captain Arthur Reginald Diggum, to request reinforcements as the position he was in was now under constant attack by Ottoman forces. The following is an account by then Private John Adams, who published this account in the military magazine Revali in 1937. Quote, Another man and myself volunteered to go with him. The sap was between 70 and 80 yards in length, and along it sat several dead Turks. On reaching the head of it, we found five of our men dead, including Sergeant Higgins and Fred Thompson, both of whom were alive when Beach left to get reinforcements. We saw that they had been shot through the head, thus a periscope was essential to our very existence, and one was found under the bodies. Beach immediately put it up and was alarmed by what he saw. Taking the periscope from him, I too received a shock at the sight of what I estimated to be four battalions of Turks forming up for another attack. Bombs were as distant as the moon, and our only weapons being rifles and bayonets. Had we attempted to aim over the top, we would have exposed our head and shoulders, and ha would have immediately followed our dead pals who had been shot through the head from the high ridges flanking the ravine. 
Beach, with tears running down his cheeks, momentarily criticized our awful predicament and remarked, It's hell to see this mass of Turks and not being able to bomb or aim at them. With a periscope fixed to a rifle, it would have been possible. He said to accurately fire without personal danger, unquote. Beach then returned to Captain Dingham and reported that the Ottoman forces were massing for another attack and returned with more reinforcements as the attack began. It was at this point that Beach came up with the idea of what would become the periscope rifle, as told by Beach to a reporter from the Herald in 1915. Quote, It took us a short time to respect the Turkish riflemen, chiefly snipers. They are crack shots. And it was a case with any man who showed his head above our trenches. Really, trench warfare is not dangerous if men take reasonable precautions against exposing themselves. One day, I faked up a sort of thing with an old biscuit box and a broken pieces of a mirror that has since become known as the trench periscope. By means of this, a rifleman now see and have a smack at the enemy without exposing himself, unquote. I just find it fascinating that Beach is able to basically Tony Stark himself a trench periscope using scraps that he saw lying around in the trench. Though it should be noted that trench periscopes were already being mass produced on the beach by the time this, this account took place. Drawing on his builder's experience, he formulated a design and constructed a braced frame that supported a modified Lee Enfield rifle that had the stock cut in half. The two halves were then reconnected to a frame and using a broken periscope mirror, aligned them to the rifle's sights and attached a string to the trigger. This allowed the rifle to be fired from the safety of the parapet. As recorded in the official history of Australia's involvement in the First World War, Major Thomas Blamey of the 1st Divisional Staff was doing the rounds of the frontline trenches when he observed two men of the 2nd Battalion, quote, engrossed in a framework of broken boxwood and wire attached to a rifle which they were endeavouring to lay on the parapet, unquote. And when Blamey asked them what they were doing, one of the soldiers replied, quote, it was an arrangement so you could hit without being hit, unquote. Blamey understandably noticed the importance of this field modification and instructed Beach to leave the line with his prototype and report to Major General A. Skeet of the Royal Engineers, who was presiding over the Anzac Inventors Board. After examining the contraption, Skeet declared it an original invention and requested a contingent of Royal Engineers be dispatched from Alexandria to assist Beach in producing more. On the 26th of May, a factory had been started on the beaches around Gallipoli, and the first periscope rifle had actually been taken to Quinn's post the day before. Apparently, the soldier who carried it up the path remarked to the various puzzled onlookers who questioned him, quote, I'm tired of fighting Turks, I'm going to play them at cricket, unquote. According to Charles Bean, the official historian of the Australian Imperial Force and official war correspondent, the periscope rifle was, at ranges up to 200 to 300 yards, found to be an accurate and deadly weapon and over 600 were constructed and distributed to the troops. Now, while modern historians dispute the 200-300 yard claim, its implementation in areas where opposing trenches were less than 200 yards, or approximately 50 to 100 meters, while less effective than an unmodified rifle, it was considered by many to be a useful weapon, especially in situations where it was certain death to expose yourself above the parapet. By the end of May, Beach had been transferred to the 1st Divisional Headquarters, and this was followed up by promotion to sergeant at the start of June. During this time, he would also invent a device known as a field paragraph. Now, this is something that I've only been able to find a single description for in a newspaper article from the Sydney Morning Herald from December of 1915, but a field paragraph is a, quote, simple apparatus whereby signaling can be carried on by the use of a lamp and mirror worked behind the safety of a dugout or observation trench, unquote. It apparently could also be used to alert main forces if a position had been taken by the enemy, but I can't find any reference of it being used in the official history or any other accounts. In fact, when you Google field paragraph, Google first thinks you're misspelling it, but there isn't a single account of the thing being used except in obituaries and news articles written about William Beach. But I digress. In August, Beach was aboard the troopship Kingstonian for duties in Alexandria, and on his arrival, he was assigned to the Ordnance Depot. In September, while he was preparing to return to the Dardanelles, he contracted an unspecified fever and a subacute rheumatism and was hospitalized until November. Medically speaking, these days rheumatic diseases is an umbrella term that refers to arthritis and several other inflammatory conditions that affect the joints, tendons, ligaments, bones, and muscles of the body. Though using the medical terminology of the day, it is safe to assume that this relates to any and all body aches caused as a symptom by whatever virus he had contracted, and this is what's causing the fever. In early October, he was also diagnosed with malaria. His condition did not improve, and he was in fact reclassified as having sciatica and neurasthemia, which is mental and or physical fatigue accompanied by dizziness, dyspensia, muscular aches or pains, tension, headaches, and an ability to relax, irritability, and sleep disturbance. 
He would be returned to Australia by the hospital ship Corolla in the 10th of November 1915 for an initial three-month rehabilitation. However, his condition would not improve and he'd be medically discharged on the 29th of February 1916. In 1916, Commander of the Australian New Zealand Expeditionary Force, General William Birdwood, wrote to the Governor-General of Australia, Sir Ronald Monroe Ferguson, quote, Our complete moral superiority over the Turk is partly due to the very clever invention of a man named Beach, who produced a periscopic rifle. When we got here, we denuded the whole of our transports of their looking glasses and made some 2,000 periscopes on our little beach. This man then made a very simple device. The result is the Turks only sees the muzzle of a rifle coming over the parapet without anything behind it to shoot at, and we understand from prisoners that he dislikes that intensely, unquote. Upon his return to Australia, Beach returned to Condobolin and became a recruitment officer in the area until 1919. Not long after his arrival, he also married Isabella Grace Lestrange. By all accounts, when not recruiting, he would settle back into civilian life and return to work in construction. At the secession of the First World War in 1920, Beach would also apply for a soldier settlement block in Condoblin and settle at a property called Reefdale. That same year, the Beaches would welcome two children, a son, William Bullock Beach, on the 31st of January 1920, and a daughter, Grace Isabella Beach, on the 24th of October. The following year, Beach Sr. would receive £100 from the Department of Defence as compensation for inventing the periscope rifle in Gallipoli. On the 18th of March 1924, the Beaches would welcome their third child, a daughter, Marjorie Mary Beach. As Beach Sr. lived in Condoblin, he plied his trade as a bricklayer, constructing numerous houses including the Melrose Hotel, a ceremonial Chinese oven at the Condoblin Cemetery, the Oxley Monument. He also constructed his own home, but when I checked Google Maps, it looks like his house is no longer standing. On the 22nd of September 1929, after a sudden onset of pneumonia, William Charles Bullock Beach would pass away at the age of 51. His remains are buried at the Condoblin Cemetery, and to honour his service, the Condoblin Beach Park Memorial, located a short distance from his home, was dedicated in his honour. He would be survived by his wife Isabella and children William, Grace and Marjorie. William Jr. would also follow in his father's footsteps and serve during the Second World War. Like so many others I've covered in this podcast, the invention and the man have become separated by history, so it's time we look back through the periscope and remember the man who undoubtedly saved numerous lives in Gallipoli, and for that, we are eternally grateful. But before I finish up here, I want to address the elephant in the room, namely, who actually invented the periscope rifle? While at the time, news reports from Charles Bean exalted the fact that it was invented on Gallipoli, it is actually well documented that such devices were already being used on the Western Front long before Anzac forces even were considered for the Dardanelles campaign. While Beach may not have invented the concept of the periscope rifle, he definitely invented it for Gallipoli. Now whether or not he knew about the other designs beforehand has been lost to history, but the Anzac Inventors Board did declare it an original invention, and as necessity is the mother of invention, I would not be surprised if more men sitting in the trenches developed similar ways to not expose themselves unnecessarily. And there you have it friends, that is the life, service and legacy of Sergeant William Charles Bullock Beach, the Australian inventor of the periscope rifle. Now, it's a real shame that he didn't get any official recognition for his invention on his time at Gallipoli, the same way that Scurry and other Gallipoli inventors did, but his legacy lives on regardless. Works cited in this episode are the service record of William Charles Bullock Beach, the find a grave entry to the final resting place of William Charles Bullock Beach, the official history of Australia in the War of 1914-1918, the unit diary of the 2nd Australian Infantry Battalion, the virtual war memorial Australia's entry on William Charles Bullock Beach, the online newspaper archive Trove, hosted by the National Library of Australia, the Army Museum of South Australia, Periscopes and Rifles by the Fraser Coast Military Trail website, Gallipoli, the Anzac Campaign Begins from the New South Wales Anzac Centenary Project, the newspaper article Periscope Rifle Out Anzacs to Hit Without Being Hit by the Daily Telegraph, the Great War 1914-1918 Forum, there's a very deep uh, debate on who invented the Periscope Rifle, the National Archives of Australia, Sniping from Below, Periscope Rifles in World War One by Tom Lemian from the United States World War One Centennial Commission, the website of the Imperial War Museum, and the website of the Australian War Memorial. I was only doing my job, and Australian Military City Podcast is made possible thanks to the generous support from each and every one of you, but in particular, our Armoured Emu Brigade community. Now, if you want to join in on the conversation, you can do so over on our social media channels. At this point, the podcast is on everything. And if you want to join the Armoured Emu Brigade community, you can do so over on our Discord server. Links to everything are on our website as well as in the episode description. But if you want to support the podcast, you now have two options. 
You can either buy the podcast a one-off coffee or join us on Patreon for ongoing support. Each cent given goes directly into digitization of records as well as distribution and licensing. Now, if you enjoy this or any other episode in the series, please leave a review or share it with a friend as it is the best way to get the show in the ears of people who need to hear it. Until next time, friends, catch you then. Bye. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job Australia's Military History Podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was recorded on the lands of the Gangdangara people whose elders have passed on knowledge for thousands of years, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. This episode was written, researched, produced, directed, and audio engineered by me, Ross, with additional research done by Laurie Favell of My Silent Hero. If you do know someone whose story needs to be told, feel free to leave a comment on an episode or send us an email at IWasOnlyDoingMyJobPod at gmail.com. If you like what we do here and you want to support the podcast, the best thing you can do is share this with a friend or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform as it really helps others find the show. And if you want to join in on the conversation, join us over on Discord. And if you want more content, including show notes, photos, transcripts, and my various adventures finding memorials dotted around Australia, head over to our website at www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on all our social media pages at IWODMJ. Don't worry, there are links to everything in the show notes. Join me personally for more bite-sized history over on TikTok and pretty much everywhere else at Doc Winters. All opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the speaker and do not reflect the views or opinions of any entity, agency, or organization. It is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike 4.0 International License. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.